Good evening. I know slavery, not the most exciting topic around, but today we're going to get through it. Hopefully, we're going to get beyond it. Some of you in the audience might have attended a performance at your local church a few years ago of a group of boys from the African nation of Zambia. It was a great performance, and as you listened to them, you would have assumed that everything was okay because they were being hosted by the pastor who said he had a ministry just north of here, near Sherman. Like everybody else in the audience, you assumed they were in good hands. You would have never thought that these boys were being subjected to what we then referred to as human trafficking, and today, more accurately, term is modern slavery. This pastor, who was from the area, had visited their village, heard them sing, they, sound, they sounded great, so he had told them if they came to America, they'd make enough money to send home to the village to build clinics and schools, which, as you can see, are much needed in their village. These are actual photos of the village. When they got here, they found that things were very different than what they thought they would be. They were crowded into mobile homes, often sleeping two in a single bunk. If the pastor was angry, he shut off the gas. If they were ill, they still had to sing. He made money from the CDs he sold of the recordings they made, but none of that went home to the village. There were no clinics. One of those boys was given Kachepa. I'll tell you a little bit more about him later in the talk tonight. They were being paid, but almost all the money went back to the pastor for food and for the high rent that, of course, as we understand, if you're living, sharing a bunk in a mobile home, the rent's going to be pretty high. So at the end of the month, they took home a couple of dollars, just a few dollars they would have. I start with this example as a shocking example of what can happen where we least expect it. These boys, what prevented these boys from walking away wasn't chains or ropes. It was something much more subtle. In almost 15 years of working with trafficked persons, I found that psychological control is more powerful than physical control. And for those in the audience who might be followers of any of the major Western religions, I want to remind you of one little thing. In the Ten Commandments, nine of the commandments are strictures about what to do and what not to do. In the first commandment, the only one in which God self-identifies as one who brought you forth from the land of bondage. So people are told to view God as one who ends slavery. Something we might want to think about as we work toward ending slavery in our times. Because this is something that is happening, it's happening around us, and we're going to try to talk tonight about some of the reasons you might be wondering, if people really are in these situations, why is it that they just don't run away, and what can we do? The simplest way of looking at what we talk as, of as modern slavery is to think in terms of if someone is using force or coercion to control another person, that simply, it could be modern slavery. It's invisible, and it could be anywhere. But let's step back a little bit first. A lot of us might have heard or read about Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass wrote a memoir about his life as a slave over 150 years ago. He wasn't chained in the basement or working in a plantation. He worked for a man who owned him in rural Maryland, who sent him into Baltimore to work every day. Frederick Douglass brought home the money and gave it back to the person who owned him. The environment, the circumstances surrounding him made leaving seem like a near impossibility. And what we're going to talk about today is how that environment, combined with psychological control, is what leads to modern slavery. And the answer to someone getting out of modern slavery isn't simply removing them physically from that situation, but something more subtle and involves psychologically empowering the individual. A woman from an Asian nation jumped out of the window of a house in the Mid-Cities area, not far from us. It was a very nice neighborhood, really was identified as an upper middle class neighborhood. She sprained her ankle, but she managed to hobble off and contact the pastor of a church frequented by members of her community. He contacted law enforcement, they investigated, found out that the couple who lived in that house were running a commercial sex operation with women from their country. They felt that they owned these women. The neighbors, some neighbors felt a little bit uneasy, thought something strange was going on because of people coming and going. Some neighbors just thought people from their community, friends, friends and relatives were coming to visit. The question is whether this is happening to the extent that I am saying it's happening. So what I'm here to tell you is that the number one industry, the number one criminal enterprise most profitable in the world today is trafficking in weapons. Tied for second in a dead heat, 
Trafficking in drugs and trafficking in human beings. Trafficking in human beings takes any form you can think of. It involves American kids who run away from home and might get trapped into commercial sex work, women from other countries that might get trapped into that, agricultural workers who might be out on farms, people working in manufacturing, welding, nursing home workers, domestic servants working in private homes, any type of work you can think of. There are unscrupulous individuals who are going to find a way to take advantage of other people, exploit them, and mistreat them. Psychological control is more powerful than physical control. The challenge is that people who are in these situations, who are being controlled by someone else, often don't see themselves as being enslaved or trafficked. So they don't reach out for help because of that psychological control. And what we're really going to talk about, what I'm going to tell you tonight, is a story of one such case which really gives many of the reasons, should help make it clear why we don't hear about more of these cases and why people don't see themselves in these situations. Police conducted a raid of several passage parlors, again, in our area. Several women were taken into custody, pretty large number. Several of these were identified as survivors of trafficking, people who were enslaved. They were then referred to a shelter where a counselor was, a reg was available on a regular basis to people who wanted to see the counselor. And I say that because that's an important aspect. Being given a choice of whether or not you want to talk to a counselor instead of being told you should talk to a counselor is important for someone who has been controlled, who has been told what to say, what to think, what to do by someone else for a period of time. So when the counselor saw these women, a typical story that one of these ladies might say was, I chose to do what I was doing. And by the way, what they were doing was commercial sex work. That's why the raids were, were there. I chose to do what I was doing. I owed a lot of money in my country. I'm going to interrupt myself here for a second. Uh, that's one of my specialties, by the way. To tell you that in some places, when you get into debt and owe money, the person to whom the money is owed is viewed as being in a position of power in the eyes of society. Until fairly recently, they were viewed as being in a position of power even in the eyes of the law. It might shock you to know that just a few weeks ago, I read a story about a prison in an American state that was identified as a debtor's prison and was closed down after legal action. So it's happening even here. So back to the story. I owed a lot of money, and, and things got even worse. I had to borrow more money. Finally, I was offered a job in America. So I knew if somehow I could do that, I would get paid enough to start paying off the debt, send money home to my family, and have a decent life for myself. So in order to get the job, it was okay. I got into even more debt to, to pay for the job, to pay for the ticket, but I came to America. Because, as all of us know, in America, Money falls from the skies. Yeah, I don't know about all of you, but I was brushing it off my shoulder as I walked into the building tonight. Uh, if you didn't notice, it's probably just because you're so used to it. So, in the story, when I got here, I thought I'd be working as a hostess in a restaurant, doing some sort of work like that. But I found I didn't really know the language well, and, and I, getting a job was difficult. I couldn't get a decent job. I owed a lot of money. I had to do what I was told. What she was told to do was work in commercial sex. Now, we're not trying to put thoughts into someone's head. If that's her choice, so be it. We just want to give each person the opportunity to make an informed decision based on knowing all the facts and outside of the control who has been telling them what to say and what to do for a period of time. In fact, these women were controlled. They were sleeping behind false walls, being told what to do every minute of the day, surrounded by signs telling them what they owed for sleeping, eating, talking on their phone, more and more and more debt. They could never get out of the debt. A true case of debt bondage, which is something that's looked for in these cases of modern slavery. One of these women talked about being driven across the country from California. She said, when the car stopped to get gas, the person driving me went into the station I could have jumped out of the car and run to the next car and asked for help. That was terrifying. The idea of doing that was frightening to her, more frightening than staying where she was. Psychological control is more effective than physical control. In addition to that, these people were all told, we know where your family is, we have contacts back there, your family is going to be hurt if you talk to authorities. Now, 
In some of the cases of trafficking that have happened, this has been true. There has been real threat to the family back home. In some cases, it hasn't been true. If you're the person in that situation, though, if that's what you're told, for you, it's very true and very frightening. You're going to do what it takes to keep your family safe. So that's the situation these women are in when law enforcement come in doing what they're supposed to do, an act of justice, trying to free these people from the situation they're in. But I'm going to ask you for a second to think about all the conditions that I've just given you and try to stretch your mind and put yourself in the position of one of these women. You've been surrounded by your own people, eating your own food, speaking your own language. Now, you're with some officers who are asking you questions such as, are you being told what to do? You can't even relate to that question. You don't even understand what you're being asked. You feel like you've been thrown into very icy water in a very deep pool. Let's step back and consider something about the brain uh, as I talk about this. And I can see by looking at this audience tonight, you've all got one. So that's a good thing. <clears throat> In the story, when, when we all know about fight or flight, we've all heard about the fight or flight syndrome. When you're in a situation where you're threatened, you're in danger, but you can't fight back and you can't run away, you go into a different mode. The limbic part of your brain kicks in. You're in survival mode, doing the bare essentials for survival, breathing, eating, trying to sleep. So that's the situation you're in when you start getting asked questions such as, how did you get from there to here? What is exactly you're doing? Are you being told to do that? Are you being paid? How much are you paid? Do you get to keep the money? That's pretty challenging for somebody with post-traumatic stress. We've all heard about post-traumatic stress disorder, and this can be viewed as a form of post-traumatic stress. We've heard about it because of the veterans returning from wars overseas. When you have PTSD, this is one of the aspects of what happens. So in addition to that aspect of your brain not functioning properly, maybe you don't speak the language very well. Maybe in your country, law enforcement can't really be trusted. In addition to all this, in a lot of cases involving groups of people, the traffickers or people controlling them have told them stories that they have to repeat if someone starts asking them about what they're doing. That story has been carefully planted, watered, and grown over time. So from this, hopefully you can understand why people who are in these situations don't reach out for help, don't self-identify, and often are even unable to tell a, a straight, coherent, honest story even when they're given the opportunity. Psychological control is more effective than physical control. And although this story that I just told taught was about people from another country, the same thing applies to an American kid who runs away from home, is out on the street, and might get trapped into commercial sex work. So this is the story of people who are going through this. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about somebody on the outside trying to uncover this case. There was a case of a motel, of a national chain, very well-known motel chain, independently owned. It's a franchise. One day, the owners of the motel call an agent for Immigration and Customs Enforcement. He is told, we have some people working for us here who are in the country illegally. You need to come and take them away, have them removed. The agent hangs up the phone and thinks, when has it ever happened that I got a call from an employer who asked me to come take away his employees? There's something wrong with this picture. So he starts investigating. He thinks maybe the employees know something about the employer that they don't want me to know. As he investigates, he finds out they're working regular jobs at the motel. One's a front desk clerk, regular eight-hour shifts, being paid $1,500 a month, which they're depositing in their bank account. But he doesn't let go. He finds that although they're getting paid $1,500 a month, the next day they're writing a check back to the owners of the motel for, you guessed it, $1,500. Regular eight-hour shifts but many nights they're awake being lectured to by the owners of the motel. The more he digs, the more he finds out. This case, would any of us have thought that this was trafficking or slavery if we knew the initial details? It was uncovered by a very determined agent for Homeland Security and a determined assistant United States attorney. As you might imagine, cases of domestic servitude are even more difficult to uncover. One day an exterminator walked into my office and said, that he exterminated a house very regularly where there was always a woman in the background that was never allowed to talk or leave. That case was investigated and uncovered. In another case, a very prosperous couple had a woman from their country who was never allowed to leave the house outside of their presence for over eight years. So 
how can we begin to identify cases like this if it really could be happening, which I will tell you it's happening in our country, in our state, and in our community. Some of the questions we might think about asking, if we're in a situation that's a comfortable situation, not a dangerous situation or even an uncomfortable situation, but let's say you frequent an establishment, you know someone there, you think they would feel comfortable talking to you. These are some questions. What sort of work do you do? Are you being paid? <clears throat> do you get to keep the money? As you've heard from the stories I've told, every story people were paid but didn't end up with the money. So that's probably one of the best questions that can be asked. Do you have control of your own papers? Could you leave if you wanted to? If we start doing this, we can start to become aware and open our eyes to the reality that human trafficking is really happening. Modern slavery is all around. If that happens, we can start to ask questions like this. We can call local law enforcement if we think something's going on that we're not comfortable or that we're uneasy about. We can call local social service providers. There are some national service providers. There's some numbers out in the lobby near the registration desk of some numbers you can call if you want to be able to contact somebody like this. If we start to do this, we can begin to change things for some people that are in these situations as things have changed for some of the boys from the choir that I talked about at the very beginning. Some of them were adopted by American families and are establishing good lives for themselves here in the U.S. I mentioned Given Kachepa at the, at the beginning. Given Kachepa expects to graduate from Baylor School of Dentistry next month. If you need some dental work done, Given is available. He couldn't be here tonight because in a few days he has a 10 and a half hour practicum exam and he thought it might be better to prepare for that. If we do this though and start changing things for people, we can begin to make the American dream a reality for them, we can begin to make these words ring true. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Thank you. <laughs>